everyone, and welcome to Occupational Therapy 245, Introduction to Research Methodology. Uh, today's topic is sampling in research, and my name is Melissa Kay. I'll be your instructor. Let's go ahead and get started. Our objectives today are to explain the steps in selecting participants for a study. That's also called a sampling plan. The second one is to identify different methods and types of sampling. And finally, we want to describe sampling strategies in quantitative and qualitative studies. So before we you know, dive in, uh, sampling is super important because it, det it helps determine the rigor and, um, and the credibility or the, the, um, the powerfulness of a study. So that's the, kind of the overarching reason. And then we'll be looking at other reasons throughout this lecture. So we have a bunch of definitions and these are in the presenter notes. So please do either look at or download the slide deck so that you uh, have a, a record of this. Uh, population is a group of people that shares a common characteristic or characteristics as defined by the investigator, also known as the researcher. Um, we define the population by inclusion and exclusion criteria. So we might say, um, the population is women from 18 to 35, right? So we're including women, we're including a particular age, we're excluding people who do not identify as women, and we're excluding people who are either under or over that age range. Our target population is the group of individuals from which the investigator is able to select a sample. So women between um, 18 and 35 is a huge population, right? Like globally. So we might say uh, women who live in the greater San Jose area, for example. Um, in order to generalize about a population, we often study a target population that's representative of the larger population. So with our example of San Jose state women, uh, that may or may not be generalizable to the world. Maybe it's generalizable to the state of California or even the West Coast, but maybe not to the East Coast or the South. You get the idea? Um, the uh, sample is a subgroup that is representative of the larger population. So we use a sample because we can't possibly uh, round up and study everybody in a population. So we use a sample. A sampling frame is a list or record of all the elements in the population from which the sampling units are drawn. So um, the elements are the actual people, right? And the sampling units are, are participants in the study. Uh, inclusion criteria is a set of characteristics or variables that determine if a person can participate in a study. And exclusion part uh, criteria is a set of criteria that eliminates potential participants from a study. So uh, some common um, exclusion criteria may be if you have a survey, um, but your uh, your uh, participant does not speak or write English. They may not be able to actually be a part of the study, and so they would be excluded. Um, in some studies, it's people with particular conditions. Um, there's a variety of exclusion criteria. So why do we sample? Well, we can't study everyone, right? There's billions of people on the earth, and we can't study them all, so we use a sample. So sampling is gathering information from a whole population, uh, sorry, is done because gathering data from a whole population is an enormous job. Um, we may have a more urgent need for data. It's too time consuming and none of us really has the money or other resources to take on an entire population. All right, so about sampling. And you'll notice that um, I have this I don't know why I picked this um, particular uh, photo, but this kind of cool photo of the um, question mark on its side, and this divides the different sections of the lecture. 
Uh, I like this chart. Um, it was uh, originally created by um, Dr. Megan Chang um, because it it kind of has all of the parts and pieces on on one screen, right? So we have sampling. There's two different types, and we'll talk about them in turn. Pri- in turn, probability and non-probability. And then there's all the different kinds of sampling, specific kinds of sampling underneath that. So do refer back to this um, graphic because it's very useful. All right, so there's a number of steps in the sampling process. First, we define the population inclusion exclusion criteria, as I said. Then we develop a plan for figuring out how are we going to get a sample from the population. We determine the sample size, and we often want to do that with the help of a statistician. Uh, As a general rule, larger samples are better than smaller samples um, because there's less chance of error, right? So there's less chance of people demonstrating a certain behavior or characteristic um, and it being like seen, even though it's not the trend, if that makes sense. Um, and then finally we implement sampling procedures. Okay. Uh, so we've, um, we've introduced these terms of part top population, target population, and sample. And here's another way of looking at it. Um, The population is a group that shares common characteristics. Um, Adults with uh, osteoarthritis. The target population is the group from which the sample is selected. So that's going to depend on the resources, time, and kind of a a reach of the researchers. So say um, it's a a large study that's funded by the NIH, we may have target populations that cover all the different regions of the U.S., right? So it's really a representative um, target population of the larger population of adults in the U.S. who have osteoarthritis. And then the sample is the people that are selected, hopefully at random, from that target population, and those are the people that we actually study. Um, so here's an example. Uh, the population is all school OTs in the U S the sample is all school OTs in San Jose. Um, the population would be OT students in the U S the sample would be who, right? And there are a couple other, um, couple other samples and questions for you to look at in your presenter notes. So check them out and we can also talk about this in class. Um, But get used to these three terms and the fact that the population is big, target population's medium, and the sample is small. All right, so the sampling frame is simply a list of all the items in your population. So it would be like, Um, all the school-based OTs in San Jose, right? So we we get a list of all of the school-based OTs in San Jose through some reliable method, and we make a a record of them. Um, And then from there, uh, we then um, get our sample, right? So the sampling frame example population is the students in OCTH245. The sampling frame is all the students who are currently enrolled in my class, right? So one thing about the sampling frame is that it's time specific, yeah? So students in um, 245 could be at any point in time that, you know, could be this year, could be next year, could be the following year, but the sampling frame is the right now. So hopefully that helps differentiate. Okay. So uh, sampling methods, and this will make up um, the bulk of the rest of the lecture. I like this. Um, I like this graphic sampling for quantitative and qualitative study designs because we do different things for each of those, and I think that this kind of um, represents some of how it's done. Right. So quantitative um, designs. 
is a process of selecting a subgroup that can accurately represent the, po the population in order to draw conclusions about that population. So we're going to generalize from the sample back to the population. In qualitative design, um, conversely, the process of boundary setting begins broadly and becomes more refined as the data is data collection proceeds. So what that means is that we, we start off kind of big and then as we find out what's going on with a phenomenon, we sort of zero in, right? So it's more of a cyclical thing as you can see in the, in the left side of, the, of that um, image. Uh, dimensions around sampling for qualitative studies include location and setting. So you may be located somewhere, that's who you sample from. Um, cultural group, personal experiences, or any particular concepts. Um, often we use non-probability sampling for qualitative studies, and we're going to get to that in just a few minutes. Okay, so probability and non-probability sampling. Probability sampling is based on probability um, theory. And the most kind of basic uh, example of probability theory is I, um, I flip a coin and how many times does it come up heads? How many times tails, right? Or I throw a die, there's an equal chance that I'll get a one, two, three, four, five, or six, right? So the selection of individuals from the population so that it's representative of the population is that everybody has an equal chance of being selected. So that's probability. And you can see on this grid on the left-hand side that um, there's uh, the, red p the red dots represent the sample and the dots are from here and there and everywhere. Non-probability sampling, um, in contrast, is a non-random method used to select a sample. So you might select participants because they're available, they're convenient, or they represent some particular characteristic that the investigator wants to study. Um, it's usually used for qualitative studies, but we also sometimes use non-probability sampling um, when we're doing a small-scale study and we don't have the resources to sample randomly. So sometimes it's used in quantitative, but definitely in qualitative. Um, it's also used when it's not either feasible or ethical to develop a sampling frame. And remember that is a list of everybody who is in the population um, that may, from which the sample may be drawn. All right, so let's dive into probability sampling. So here's example one, and we're gonna run through a variety of examples. Um, simple random sampling. What this means is that um, you draw from the population and everybody has an equal chance of being selected. Um, researchers might use a random number table or they might go old school and actually draw numbers from a hat. Um, when I have sampled for small scale studies, I've actually rolled a die, right? And if it's even, you go in group A. If it's odd, you grow, go in group B. Um, there's also systematic sampling, which means that you choose every nth individual or site in the population until the desired sample size is achieved. For example, every third person gets the intervention. Um, so that is a, a, a sort of an outgrowth of simple ramble, random sampling. All right, so probability sampling type two. And it's not officially type two, I've just labeled them so you can keep track of them. So this is called systematic sampling. So this is, whoops, I just told you about it. Sorry about that. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna move this from, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna move this from here to the next slide. So um, now we have a picture of what I described to you erroneously on the next slide. Sorry about that, you guys. Okay, so this is systematic sampling. Here we have three divisions of potential um, folks for a study, and we randomly um, pick one from each group. Probability sampling three. This is called stratified sampling. 
Um, stratified sampling is dividing the sample into known subgroups and a fixed percentage is randomly drawn from each group. So you'll see um, on the left hand side there's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 and they randomly drew 4 out of the 10. Um, in the middle um, column they randomly drew 2 out of 10 and then in the last group 3 out of 10. So random selection is from predetermined uh, classifications like age, diagnosis, geographical location, etc. All right, probability sampling four. This is cluster sampling. So um, the sample is chosen in one or two stages because the population is not easily identified or is so large so multi-stage sampling is needed. So for example, if you have a hospital, right, full of people that may be in your study. Um, so first you divide the, um, the uh, population frame into groups, and you'll notice there's three groups here, and then you randomly select a number of participants from those groups. So it's two stages. And then this one is multi-stage sampling. So you have a population, you choose some pods from the population, and then you choose individuals from those pods. Um, there's some overlap in the way that it's done, right? You can see that some is multi-stage, some is single stage. And this is an example of multi-stage, which would also fit cluster sampling. And um, yeah, and so it's a different way of looking at it. Okay, and then um, this is called proportional stratification sampling. So uh, I'm going to go through this with you. Um, we have a population of 9,000, and N means the number of people in, um, in the population and in the sample. Capital N is for population, small n for sample. Um, so then within that population, we have 6,000 boys and 3,000 girls. Then we follow those yellow arrows to the right, and we see that 66% um, of the population is um, boys and 33 is girls. And um, you know this uh, this slide was made a while ago, so I'm noting that um, now it actually is outdated, and I'll just cop to that. Um, my apologies. Um, but now we would actually include a third group, which would be a non-binary, right? Um, so a they, them group. So my apologies for that, but please bear with the, um, the example. Okay, so we have two thirds of the population and then one third, right? Then we go to random selection from that population, but it's based on the proportion of boys, right? So 6,000 boys, 66% of the population equals 200, right? Because there's twice as many boys as girls. And then the girls, we get 100 for the sample for a total of 300. So hopefully that makes sense that we would keep the proportions um, identical even when we're choosing a sample. All right, so we're about halfway through. Um, I'd like to request that you uh, um, stop your playback, get up, stretch. I don't know if you're gonna be able to go and take a, a beautiful, gorgeous kayak, um, but have a drink of water, stretch out, take some breaths, get your brain back together, and then come back and we will finish up the lecture. I'll see you in a minute. Okay, welcome back. Um, at this point, we're gonna look at non-probability sampling, right? So we looked at probability sampling, and now we're gonna look at non-probability sampling. Uh, non-probability sampling in quantitative studies, remember I said for sure it's used in qualitative studies, but it also may be used in quantitative studies. And there is a number of different types. Um, there's convenience sampling, snowball sampling, purposive sampling, and quota sampling. And um, I think I have pictures of each of these, and there are definitions as well. 
So, uh, yeah, this, this gave almost all the information. Let's go back for one sec, and then you can use the, um, the graphic uh, to see examples. So convenience sampling, um, we enroll people who are available until we have the sample size that we want, right? So uh, I I'm just going to take people that I, that I actually can get into my study. Snowball sampling is that the researcher asks participants to identify other participants who may be willing to participate as well. So it's also called word of mouth networking. Um, a, a good friend of mine who is a deaf educator was doing her PhD and that and her sample was very specific, right? So deaf educators. Uh, and so she reached out to the deaf educators that she knew to complete her survey and then asked them to reach out to deaf educators that they knew. So that's what snowball sampling is. Um, and for those of you that have never lived anywhere snowy, we start with a little, a little bit of snow that we pack together and then we roll it and it gets bigger and bigger. So that's the snowball analogy. Um, purposive sampling is deliberately selecting participants based on a predefined criteria. And it might be um, age, it might be diagnosis, it might be a functional deficit. There's a lot of reasons why we might pick particular people. Uh, the drawback of it, of course, is that if we pick for a particular criteria, those people come with a whole bunch of other criteria that might muddy up our data, right? Because we haven't randomly selected them. And then finally, quota sampling. So we select participants who are representative of a population based on stated parameters. So the same pr proportion in the, um, in the population. So for example, um, uh, females, and I'm gonna change this up right now, females, um, non-binary, and males in OT. So we set the numbers of the percentage of males, females, and non-binary individuals in the population, and then we apply it to our study for quota sampling. Now this is different from stratified random sampling, remember that chart that I showed you, because the participants are not chosen randomly. They're chosen, uh, they're chosen uh, because they're around or because we know them or because they fit the criteria. So it's a little bit different. Um, okay, so that is non-probability sampling, the, um, the uh, definitions. And here are some uh, pictures that help with that, right? And you can look at those as, um, as you need to. And if you're a, a visual type learner, um, maybe this method of presentation will be handy for you. Okay. So then we have non-probability sampling for qualitative studies. So I'm saying so an awful lot. Uh, we want, in some cases, maximum variation. That's one type. So we seek individuals who are very different in the areas of focus for the study. We might want homogeneous selection. That is choosing individuals with similar experiences. We could go for theory-based selection, which is choosing individuals who exemplify a particular theoretical construct. We might go with confirming and disconfirming cases, which is purposively, in other words, on purpose, selecting an informant who will either support or challenge an emerging theory. Now remember, this is qualitative, and so um, it's not about proving yes or no, it's about exploring a phenomenon. And then we also may go with extreme or deviant cases, which is also known as outlier sampling. This selection of an individual who represents an extreme example of the phenomenon or interest. So we might take the most way out there outlier so that we can investigate a particular phenomenon. Um, yeah. So that's non-probability sampling. And as I said, we'll get into um, both of these more as you start reading literature, finding out about how folks sampled, and, um, and start thinking about your own literature review. Now let's talk about bias and error. <laughs> 
Sampling bias is defined as a distortion that arises when a sample is not representative of the population from which it was drawn. And there's a number of different kinds of bias. There's self-selection bias. So um, there's examples in the presenter notes um, for each of these. Uh, Self-selection bias is that somebody um, participates uh, for a particular reason in in a study and um, you know they they volunteer right so the example is um, a university newspaper ran an ad asking students to volunteer for a study in which intimate details of their sex lives would be discussed the sample of students would not be representative of the students of the university right because they had to be willing to talk about their sex lives um, they had to be more interested in technology because it was an online ad and um, and they may not really represent the population at all. So uh, we want to watch out for that. And we can talk more about different examples of self-selection bias. Under coverage bias is the next type. And um, that a common type of, uh, of under coverage bias is when there's too few observations from the segment of the population. In other words, there's not enough coverage. You don't have enough individuals to really represent the population. Uh, and an example of this is um, uh, a poll that was taken by uh, a, a journal called Literary Digest in 1936 that indicated that Landon would win the election against Roosevelt by a large margin. And in reality, it was Roosevelt who won by a large margin. We have a much more current example of um, Clinton and Trump, right? So everyone thought Clinton would win, and that's what the poll said. And the polls uh, had some under coverage and probably some other problems as well. But um, what was true and what was sampled were two different things. So under coverage bias is another type of sampling bias. And then the third type is survivorship. And this occurs uh, when observations recorded at the end of an investigation are non-random. So in some cases, there, um, you know, it's like the last man standing. Why is the last man standing? Well, we could say um, because they personify the characteristic we're interested in, or we could just say they're the last survivor. And um, and so, let's see. Uh, in World War II, um, there was a statistician who analyzed the distribution of hits from anti-aircraft fire on aircraft returning from missions. The idea was that this information would be useful for deciding where to place extra armor. The naive approach would be to put armor at locations that were frequently hit to reduce the damage. However, it would ignore the survivorship bias occurring because only a subset of aircraft return. Um, the statistician's approach was the opposite. If there were few hits in a certain location on returning planes, then hits in that location were more likely to bring a plane down. Therefore, the statistician, Wald, recommended that locations without hits on the returning plane should be given extra armor. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole uh, theory behind it and all of that. But suffice to say that um, it is a third type of sampling bias that occurs when the observations that are recorded at the end of the investigation are not a random set that were present at the beginning, right? So things have changed, but the sampling stays the same. All right, um, so here's some questions for you. What potential bias could occur? A researcher polls people as they walk by on the street. So think about that and think about um, why bias could occur and potentially what kind of bias. And then the second question, and we'll talk about this in class, uh, is a TV show host asks his viewers to visit his website and respond to an online poll. Why might that be biased? Okay, so those are some thought experiments for you. Then we have uh, error. So we, we said we'd talk about sampling and error, and now we're talking about 
sorry, bias and error. And now we're talking about the error part. Okay. There are um, several types of error and sampling error are inaccuracies in what we infer about a population that come about because researchers have taken a sample rather than studied the whole population, right? So we have a good reason for studying a, a, a sample rather than the whole population because it's time consuming, it's expensive, and we can't access the whole population, but it comes at a price. Um, a sampling error is an estimate of how a sample statistic is expected to differ from the population. Probability and random sampling and large samples reduce sampling error. So if we have random sampling, we have a large sample, it reduces that inevitable error. We have population specification error. Um, this occurs when a researcher doesn't understand who they should survey. Um, for example, imagine a survey about breakfast cereal, right? Who do you survey? It might be the entire family, the mom or the kids. Now the mom might make the purchase decision, but the children actually may be the people who are making the choice, right? So who do we sample? Um, sample frame error is the next one. And that occurs when the wrong subpopulation is used to select a sample. A classic frame er error occurred in the 1936 presidential election between Roosevelt and Landon. Again, uh, the sample frame was from car registrations and telephone directories. But in 1936, many Americans didn't own cars or telephones, and those who did were Republicans. So they got the wrong results because they didn't sample the right people. Then there is a uh, selection error. This occurs when respondents self-select their participation in the study, right? So only those that are interested respond. Those who aren't, who may be more typical or indicative of a phenomenon, are not actually in the sample. So it's that self-selection. And then non-response. Um, so non-response occurs when respondents are different from those who do not respond, right? So. Uh, the, it can occur because either the potential respondent was not contacted or they refused to respond. They might have been too busy. They might have filled out a whole bunch of surveys, what have you. The extent of this non-response error can be checked through follow-up surveys using other kinds of models of sampling. And then there are sampling errors. These occur because variation in the number of representativeness of the sample, these occur because of variation in the number of representatives of the sample that responds, right, to a survey, for example. Sampling errors can be controlled by careful research design, using large samples, um, using parametric sampling as opposed to non-parametric, and monitoring response. In other words, following up with people so that you're sure that what you think is happening actually is happening. And there's a link for you if you want to know more about that. Okay, we're in the home stretch. Uh, slide 32 of 39, sample size. So how do you know if your sample is big or small enough? Well, um, there's uh, different ways of determining this. In a quantitative study, we do something called a power analysis, and we wind up with a percent um, that gives us an idea of if our, if our sample size is powerful enough to represent the population. In a qualitative study, it's very different, and we use something called data saturation. So that means, did we get enough data that um, we are certain that um, it actually has saturated or covered the phenomenon that we're interested in studying? So here's an example of uh, power analysis, again, quantitative. Um, the purpose is to determine the minimum sample size to detect statistical significance. Um, there's a number of different terms. A significance level, that is denoted by a small p, 
And in social sciences, including occupational therapy, typically our significance level is 0.05 or 5%. If we're talking about um, medical studies, it's typically 0.01 or 1%. Uh, The power, we want a minimum of 0.80 or 80%. And that is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis. And we'll talk more about this, but um, you should know these terms well enough so that you understand when you're reading a research study, oh, their their significance level is 0.05. Okay, great. That makes sense. If their significance level is 0.2, that means that 20% of the time they might actually be wrong. Um, So we we keep it at 0.05 for OT typically. And then um, the type of analysis is going to determine how much power um, the study has. Uh, There's different types of statistical tests, and they have different amounts of robustness. And if that didn't make total sense, that's totally okay. Uh, And finally, there's something called effect size. And effect size is about the practical importance of the findings. So... um, we, if we have a super large sample, we could get statistical significance, which means that the, um, the results are meaningful. The results actually indicate that there is um, something happening. Uh, and it could only be happening because we have a huge sample size, right? So the bigger the sample, the more likely we are to find statistical significance. So we use effect size, this secondary measure, to say, okay, well, we found statistical significance, but kind of like, how significant is it? How important is it to us in practice? Now, again, we need to balance the size of our samples, because we know that bigger samples are better, with Um, practical considerations like how much time, how much money we have to conduct a study. So it's always sort of like this weight and balance um, proposition to uh, get the most rigorous study possible while at the same time making it feasible. All right, in a qualitative study, and now we're, um, you know, we're going back to this idea of sample size and how do we determine that, we get data saturation. And the intent is to develop an understanding of what is typical or common to a group, not to generalize the results. Now that may seem counterintuitive, but in a qualitative study, we want to understand rather than generalize. Um, The sample size is determined by the informational needs and data quality can affect sample size. So we can recruit additional participants midway through the study based on the data that emerges um, and where we're at in the study. So it's a much more fluid process. Uh, Decisions to stop sampling and to stop collecting data are guided by data saturation. And data saturation is defined as sampling to the point at which no new information is obtained and redundancy is achieved. So you're getting the same responses over and over again, and you know, oh, okay, I guess I've heard what there is to hear. This is a very important step in qualitative studies because it adds rigor to the study. So for qualitative uh, studies, different types of studies um, have different kind of typical sample size guidelines. So for ethnography, um, 25 to 50 people, phenomenology, 2 to 25, and grounded theory, 20 to 30. Um, And then uh, study design preview. Um, So we... uh, uh, are at the end of our um, of our lecture, but I want to give you sort of a heads up of what's to come. Um, and it's in this chart, basically. So you'll see that there are different um, types of qualitative study and quantitative. So qualitative is more naturalistic, quantitative is more experimental, and then um, there's 
uh, epistemology, approach, purpose, context, format, investigator, um, and information about um, the two different types. And over the next few weeks, we're going to dig into quantitative designs and qualitative designs and look at that more. So this is just a little heads up for you. All right, guys, you made it through another one. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I hope that this was helpful. If you have questions, um, please jot them down, bring them to class. We will be um, covering questions and clarifying some of this. And I hope you have a great day and I'll see you real soon. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.